Good afternoon, or evening, or whichever part of the world it is for you. Um, get the live reading of Chapter 8 of Speculum today. We will get this done, and then share a couple events, and be on our way. So. Chapter 8, Proving Ground. Broken down wagons lined each side of the road, strung together with wooden planks running them into a makeshift stands. The people were peddling their wares dressed in little more than rags. Ravion walked along the the aisles, uh, eyeing, eyeing the less than desirable items being displayed. He couldn't help but feel sorry for them. Most were malnourished and covered in dirt. They weren't the worst, uh, worst he'd seen in this nation, but they clearly weren't the best either. How could they live this way was beyond him. Or how they could live this way was beyond him. It seemed so primitive compared to the comforts he'd grown accustomed to in Shadgol. Even Marbane, small as it was in comparison, had at least paved streets. This was little more than a glorified village acting as a capital city. Perhaps it all went, uh, perhaps if all went according to plan, he could make some changes and improve these people's lives. Making his way to the city square, he climbed up on the stack of wooden crates. Turning to face the majority of citizens, he cleared his throat and spoke, letting his voice carry over the city. People of Fender Spear, hear me. My name is Ravion Santel. I've seen the quality of life the people of this land face, and I wish to make a difference. I believe I can help to ensure your families are fed and clothed. I can help establish trade routes with the rest of Dalmora. I can ensure the protection of your homes from the frequent, frequent orc raids. I do not seek to rule you. I simply seek to wish to make... Er, I simply... Simply wish to make your lives easier. You do not need a roar. You are some. Uh, you need someone who knows a thing or two about economics and government. I don't expect that you take my word for it. I'm aware of the customs this land holds to the highest value. With that knowledge, I wish to enact the right of Godric. Any who wish to oppose me, please step forward. Every when, man, woman, and child within earshot turned to face the Drew Slayer. They were captivated by his words. Never before had one addressed the issues they faced on a daily basis. Many had come to claim the right, but no one had ever, er, but no one so educated. It was usually some kid fresh out of his training seeking to make a name for himself. Unfortunately, the only name they ever made was on their headstone. One of the citizens, an elderly woman, hobbled to the front of the crowd and extended her wrinkled hand to the young dollar eye. Ravion took the woman's hand and stepped down from his stage. What may I do for you, ma'am? She spoke in a sweet, uh, weak yet sweet voice, only heard due to the silence of the world around them. Young man, the right of Godric grants you a room and meal during your trials. I'd be honored if you'd stay at my inn. It would be my pleasure, though I hope you'll do me the honor of allowing me to compensate you for your hospitality during my stay. Uh, if you feel the need to show charity, please apply the meal towards someone who needs it. She bowed as deep as her frail body would allow. Uh, pushing against her walking stick, she pulled herself up and made for the mm -hmm. end, one step at a time. Ravion escorted the woman to one of the larger buildings. It was one of the few two-story structures in town, and the only one with a collection of glass windows along the upper floor. The single wooden door painted red stood near the center of the wide establishment. Despite its aged appearance, it was in much better condition than the other buildings surrounded it. Ravion grabbed the brass handle and pulled the door open, gesturing to the woman to enter with his free hand. She smiled, patting him on the arm, and stepped inside. The interior had a strong scent of pine. Ravion glanced around at the wooden furniture, uh, carved of cedar and other soft woods. They were coated in a hev heavy layers of flax, uh, flax oil, leaving a glossy sheen on the smooth surface. Looking around the occupants, he noticed very few elderly men, or er, noticed a few elderly men sitting about one of the tables playing a game of cards. They didn't bother looking up from their game. A portly man was hard at work in the back room rolling out dough on the countertop. He was covered in flour and had glitter. Damn phone rings all the time. Covered in flour and had glistening sweat at atop his forehead. Overall, it was a fairly relaxed setting. Roughly twelve tables made up the common room, with the dining room on the far side and the kitchen on the other side of that. To his right, a small section of 
was elevated by a platform just wide enough for a band to find comfort. Across the stage, leading, uh, leading above the dining room was a wax banister, wrapped around and disappearing into the lair above. The elderly woman turned to him, weakly balancing herself. Take a seat. I'll get you a key. Refusing to wait for a response, she pressed onward, making her way across the common room toward the back door. Ravion picked a table up the stairs, ensuring he could watch the entrance. If he was going to spend any time here, he needed to scout the place and find any other exits. Taking his seat, he stretched his back against the wooden supports. It was a comfort, a comfort he desperately missed. Reaching into his belt pouch, he pulled out a stained leather bag and a long-stemmed pipe. Packing it full of stale tobacco, he put the stem in his mouth and searched the room. Spotting his query, he quickly got up and made for the fireplace to the left side of the entrance. He reached up, grabbed a, uh, reached up and grabbed a spill from the ceramic jar and carefully stuck it into the fire, watching the end ignite. Gently drawing on the pipe, he watched the tobacco turn black and then finally burn. After ensuring it was lit, he tossed the thin stick into the flames and returned to his seat. Blowing a large puff of smoke into the air, he watched a man step through the entrance, pausing to look at the occupants. His eyes locked on Ravion. Approaching, he pulled out a chair and took a seat across from him. It's quite a speech you gave. I must say, I'm impressed. And you are? Ravion quickly assessed the man. He clearly didn't belong to the commoners of this land. He was dressed too fine for that. <clears throat> His face was smooth, suggesting he had recently had a shave, and his dark brown hair was clean and combed. Ah, forgive me. I forget sometimes my name has little meaning elsewhere. I am Wallace Thermo, and I've made it my personal duty to aid the fine people of this land, much as you yourself have just proclaimed. The right of Godric is a nasty business, and you'll need help if you er, and you'll need all the help you can get. Godric. Or, I'm sorry, the, the right of Godru is a nasty business, and then Ravion corrects him to Godru. My mistake. So what do you say? Do you feel like making an ally? Mr. Wallace wasn't? That's correct. Wallace Thermo. Well, Mr. Wallace Thermo, what is it exactly you do? I deal in new beginnings. Let's say I, I've had, or let's say you've had a run of bad luck. You come to me, I look at your problems you're having, and I make them go away. For a modest fee, of course. And these problems, I assume they're to be of uh, monetary nature. Is there any other kind? I see. Well, Mr. Thermo, Ravion paused, leaning back in his chair. I do not believe myself in need of your services. In fact, I feel your very presence and position in this city is one of the many problems that requires fixing. When these trials are up, uh, I'll be taking a look into your business endeavors. Uh, take that as you will, Mr. Wallace Thermo. Though I hope you'll have this, uh, have the foresight to straighten your affairs before I find myself in a position to do something about them. Wallace jumped up, knocking over his chair. Now wait just a minute. I'm a reputable businessman. You'll show me the proper respects. A mild smirk formed at the edge of the enraged man. He looked like a child throwing a fit and not getting his way. Ravion casually took another drag off his pipe, blowing the smoke to the side as if to prevent further insult. Let me stop you there before you say anything you're really going to regret. I might say the same about you. Just who the hell do you think you are threatening me like that? Ravion Santel, Drew Slayer, founder of the Order of the Trident, Councilman of Marbane, and former escort of the previous Baron of Delmora, Archmagus Paramin Salazar. He offered a mock salute with his pipe, refusing to stand. Aye, but you're... You have no status here, Drew Slayer. What makes you think you can interfere in my affairs? Ravion sighed heavily, laying his pipe on the table. Leaning forward, he spoke as clear and calm as possible, hoping the man would get the hint. Aside from the treaties signed by all of the Lords of Dalmora, my border wardens have legal right to enter any land for the purpose of justice. If that weren't reason enough, I'll soon complete these trials and I'll have lordship over this land. At which point, no amount of groveling or bribery will be able to protect you from me. Now I suggest you either pay these fine people for their services and have a meal or go about your day. Wallace's face flushed red. Short of drawing the dagger he stuffed short of drawing the dagger he had stuffed in his waist, there wasn't much he could do in response to the insolence this man offered him. And a single dagger against a trained warrior? There was no way he could win. Good day, mister. I suggest you keep a set of eyes behind you. 
You never know when someone's going to make a move. Ravion smiled at the coward. Is that a threat? Just a friendly reminder. He offered a half-hearted salute and turned, making his way out the door. The woman returned carrying a small brass key tied to a piece of leather. She laid the key on the table and bent down, picking the chair up, returning it to its proper location. Wallace Thurmeau, she shook her head. He's nothing but trouble. Did you have some experience with him? Ravion asked. Aye, a few years ago. Just got him paid back last summer. Took every bit of savings we had, but we're all done with him now, thank the gods. Now what can I get you to eat? Anything without turnips, thank you. She nodded and made her way to the back, or made her way back toward the kitchen. A few moments later, a long, young man brought out a platter with sliced meat and stewed vegetables piled about. A large hunk of bread rested on the edge of the plate, the bottom side slightly soggy from the collection of juices. The man sat the dish on the table, sliding it across the seated warrior. What can I get you to drink? Anything you have of it, or if you have any available, I'll have tea. Though if not, water is fine. He bowed and rushed off. Ravion moved the bread in hopes that it wouldn't collect any more moisture. Spooning the vegetables, he took a, b a bite, tasting the butter melted into them. The young man returned a moment later, carrying a small glass mug and a ceramic pitcher. Steam rose from the top. He laid the cup on the table and poured the water into it. It swirled, turning a murky brown from the minced leaves resting at the bottom. He slid the cup across the table and set the pitcher on the edge. Pulling out a chair, he took a seat. So you're going to help us get out from old... Or out from under old Wallace, huh? Ravion wiped the food from his mouth and regarded the boy. He had to have been in his late teens, more than likely trapped in such a, more than likely trapped in such an existence, tending to his parents' needs. There was no shame in it, though he never desired such a life. One of the many issues I'd like to assist with. Well, good luck with him. Guy's a snake. Wouldn't surprise me if he's throwing money about right now. Probably gonna hire someone to come after you. That's what he does to people that can't pay him. He fancies himself too righteous to get his hands dirty, one of the men playing cards across the room said. Ravion glanced over at them. Their game had ceased, all eyes on him. I assume you've seen this? Uh, don't have to see it. Been through it. About five years back. I owed him a handful of silver. He hired two kids from, or two kids to come beat on me every day for a week. At the end, I was still two silver short. He had my leg broken. Wasn't much I, or wouldn't do it himself. Always tends to send someone else to deliver the message. Ain't that, or that ain't all, the boy interjected. He's got a whole, uh, whole group of guys working for him. One of these shops misses a payment, he sends them to rough the place up. Ravion took a sip of tea. It had just the hint of centrus mixed in with barley. I see. Sounds like I may have to... It sounds like I may have to have my work cut out for me. Do you know of... <clears throat> do you know of... Uh, let's see. Fuck. Do any of you know what I'm looking to face during these trials? The elderly man stuffed the chef... Uh, shuffled the deck of cards and began dealing them out again. Never seen anyone finish them. It's a week-long trial. Sole object is to survive. Nothing is off limits. If you're the last... Er, if you last the week, the position's yours. I don't recall anyone other than the, uh, than the mage completing them. Though, let's see. Though you said you've never seen anyone finish. I did. Uh, they've been around a long time, but I've never seen it. The mage was before my time. He was the last lord we had, though nobody's sure why he left. Some say he went on to bigger things. Others say the seat is cursed. Hard to say. This mage, does he have a name? Sure. I sure did. Though they say the chair strips it from you. I don't know if there's any truth to that. But he was called... Uh, Primrin. Primrin when I was a boy. Never heard it spoken again. Uh, or never heard it spoken again after he disappeared. Throne's been empty ever since. Good to know. No problem. He shifted shifted to face his friend, clearly growing impatient with the lack of attention. Oh, one more thing. You'd better learn to sleep with your eyes open. When, uh, when I said anything goes, I meant it. The last kid who tried had his throat cut while he was asleep. These people don't hold anything back. Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. Next section. 
Staggering from the powerful blow, Ravion caught himself before he fell. He exhaled, forcing the senses back into submission. His blackened vision returned, revealing the head of a large mallet headed straight for him. Relying on his agility, he twisted, narrowly dodging the crushing blow. He heard the fence post collapse behind him. Noting the large man's broad side, he thrust his palm outward, shoving firm against the man's shoulder. Thrown off by the balance, or thrown off by the unexpected shove, he staggered sideways and buried the hammer, or the buried hammer slipped from his grip. Ravion spun around, using the distraction to position, position himself. Stepping behind the man, he jumped onto his back, locking arms around his thick, muscular throat. He could feel the man's throbbing pulse beneath his grip, increasing against his constriction. Dozens of spectators cheered from the outskirts of the battle, careful to keep their distance. They didn't want to risk, risk getting caught up in the fight. Some feared for the smaller, more agile man, while others in the crowd cheered the brute, begging him to spill blood. Ravion could hear mixed cheers. They were the least of his concerns at the moment. So long as everyone kept their distance, he wasn't overly concerned. The barbarian panted heavily, staggering against the added weight. His already red face was beginning to turn purple from lack of oxygen. Ravion held the man, or felt the man growing weak. Did Wallace hire you? Choking on his words, he managed to get the single syllable out. Yes. Ravion squeezed as hard as he could, feeling the bones pop beneath his arms. He wasn't sure if they were his own or his prey. Clinging tightly, he felt the man stumble. He fell face first and slammed into the dirt, sending a cloud of dust in the air around him. Ravion felt the impact. Even softened by his cushion, it didn't help his arms any. His elbow throbbed, but he would survive. Ensuring the brute was finished, he slowly released his hold, hoping, hoping he'd stay down. Pushing himself up, he got to his feet and reached out to make, or reached down to make sure the man was still breathing. There was no sense in killing him over something so trivial. The barbarian drooled into the dusty road, unaware of the world around him. His chest heaved, compensating for the lack of air he'd suffered. Smiling, Ravion took it, took to his full weight, knocking the dust from his clothing. He rubbed his bruised elbow, filling the broken skin at the end. It was bruised and tender, but relatively minor, all things considered. He wiped the sweat from his forehead and looked at the mixture of glossy perspiration, blood, and smeared dirt clinging to his fingers. Instinctively, he wiped them on his pant leg and searched the crowd for any other challengers. He took a small amount of pleasure locking eyes on the several he'd already defeated. They hadn't expected him to be ready for their ambush. Their whole plan fell apart, having underestimated his superior dexterity. A sharp pain shot through his side, caressing his ribs... Caressing his ribs, he softly pushed, hoping it would ease the pain. He couldn't be sure, but it was possible two of them were broken. He wasn't going to give them the satisfaction of knowing that, though. He slowly made his way for the water trough. Dipping his hands into the cold, uh, cold liquid, he cleaned his face, uh, letting the cool rouse him. He glanced down at the sheaved sword stashed beneath it, happy to see it was still there. Eyeing his father's hilt, he took a large gulp and turned back to or turned to make his way back to the center of the crossroad again. It was a bit foolish. Uh, it was a bit foolish I'm not allowed a weapon, though I suppose I have to, haven't killed anyone yet. Maybe I can keep it that way. There's no reason to take life over a silly sport, he thought. Besides, doing this barehander will prove I'm the strongest, strongest among them. He marched to the center of the crossroad, bur uh, burying his pains. Throwing his hands up, despite the shooting pain in his side, he sh shouted, shouted above the chatter of warriors, I've bested every man that's had the courage to face me. I've done so without a weapon for the glory and honor required, uh, required of me by the parameters of the right of Godric and the sacred laws of Krondar. Is there anyone else who will face me? The crowd erupted a deafening roar of shouts and celebration. Not a single word could be heard above the rest. Ravion watched them move, unsure where the next one was going to come from. He needed to find him quickly. It wouldn't serve his purpose to be hit before he was ready. He spotted a glimmering head towering over the rest. It pushed its way through the front, revealing an even larger man than the last. He wore blood-red tunic and tan leather breeches... <clears throat> he wore a blood-red tunic and tan leather breeches covered in soot. His bald head was offset by a long handlebar mustache. He didn't carry a weapon, but from the look of his bulging muscles, he didn't need one. 
The challenger stepped into the open, pressing his knuckles against one another. Ravion heard them pop in the distance. Wiping the blood from his face, he took a deep breath and prepared himself for the fight. The man charged, ramming his soul, uh, shoulder into the weaker man's gut. Lifting him into the air, he carried him across the clearing and, and rammed him into one of the fence posts, splintering it beneath the weight. Or, it splintered beneath their weight and broke, sending Ravion to the ground with it. Panic enveloped him. Stealing his breath, he forced himself to remain calm, sucking air through his nose, hoping to avoid taking in too much at once. It was hard to breathe through the dried blood connected in his nasal passage, but it was required if he was going to be methodical. The huge man reached down, grabbing one of the loose-fitting dirty blue clothing, or grabbing the loose-fitting dirty blue clothing. Pulling him from the dirt, he lifted him a few feet and slammed him back to the ground. Wasting no time, he drew back and punched, hoping to break the smaller man's will. Ravion saw the incoming blow. Throwing his hand up, he caught the man's arm, slowing the attack. Seizing opportunity, he kicked out, wrapping his legs around the man's shoulders and head. He squeezed with every ounce of his strength, hoping to drain him of his raw power. The challenger easily lifted him and slammed him back down. He was severely limited in his current state. Lifting him again, he repeated the process, unable to break the agile Drew Slayer's hold. Ravion exhaled each time he hit the ground, keeping his body under control. The pain was excruciating, but he had to endure. For Scenaria, squeezing tighter, he, he felt the man's weakened grip, or felt the man weaken beneath his grip. He had to, com had to compliment the man on his tactic. It was a good attempt, but he planned for such, using each blow to strengthen his hold. It couldn't be much longer now. His legs were compressing the man's throat. A moment longer and he wouldn't be able to breathe. And that would give him the upper hand he'd been waiting for. He felt the man slam him down again, uh, heaving between his legs. It seemed he lacked the strength to pick him up another time. The large man felt the grip tighten around his throat. He had to break free. He couldn't hold his breath for long. And even if he could, there were other ways to shut a man down with access to his neck. He was already beginning to slow, his arms getting heavy. Ravion tightened his grip, taking the slack from the exhausted opponent. He'd already won, for, uh, he'd already won so long as nothing changed in the next few seconds. But it would, it always seemed to. He forced a premature smile down, not because he wasn't entitled to it, because it was possible his nose would start to bleed again. Feeling the last bit of strength leave his opponent, he stared into his pleading eyes. Are you one of Wallace's boys? The man shook his head as best he could. I thank you for that. You have my respect. Squeezing a moment longer, he felt the man fall limp. Releasing his hold, he ensured no permanent damage was done to either himself or the sleeping man. He stretched his back, feeling his ribs pop back into place. If anything, they'd, uh, they felt better now. Knocking the dust from him once again, he turned to the crowd. Is there no one else? Searching their faces, he hoped no one would step forward. Moonlight reflected off the glazed uh, window, illuminating the room in a pale white. The wooden door slowly creaked open, revealing a cloaked figure. It stepped into the room and closed the door. Cautiously making its way toward the bed, it stared at the gent gently rising and falling blanket, made of uh, thick, green-dyed wool. Ravion heard the floorboards creak. Gathering his senses, he listened to the footsteps, slowly making their way closer to him. He felt the warmth of a body hovering above him. Waiting for the perfect moment, he cracked his eyes just enough to see the figure. Scenario? Shh, you should be sleeping. You've had a rough day. You need to rest. What are you doing here? It's not safe for you yet. She reached down, gently caressing his cheek. Uh, smiling, she took in the sight of him. He was one of a kind, a noble warrior unlike any she'd met before. I had to see you. I wanted to make sure you were all right. A smile came to his face. Throwing the blanket to the side, he reached out and pulled her down beside him, kissing her deeply. His lips argued, or his ribs argued in protest, but it was worth it. Lost in his embrace, Scenaria cuddled up beside him, forgetting herself for the briefest moment. Memories rushed back, uh, rushed back. She pushed him away, hearing him wince in pain. You need to rest. We can be together once you've healed. It's not that bad, just a few screw, uh, scrapes and bruises, he lied. She sighed and unwrapped her cloak, tossing it on the table. Uh, tossing it on the table, she pulled her armor and weapons off, laying them on top of it. Crawling in the bed beside him, she kissed his forehead. Tonight we sleep. 
you don't know what tomorrow's challenges will bring, and I don't want to risk losing you to some foolish exertion. He chuckled and pulled the blanket back over him. Yes, ma'am. Wrapping his arms around her, he pulled her tight, feeling the bond he'd never experienced before. Hours passed, Rav and Ravion awoke, seeing a figure standing in the shadows a few feet from the bed. He could feel Sonaria's head lying against his chest. Glancing over at the table, their weapons were too far out of reach. He couldn't couldn't readily get to the dagger stuffed under the pillow, not having expected Sonaria to join him. The figure stepped forward, brandishing a rusty dagger. I, I'm sorry. The voice sounded like that of a child. The word shot of, the word shot fear through him. He ripped the blanket away, searching for Sonaria, or searching Sonaria for a wound. She awoke, jumping from his sudden outburst. Finding the intruder, she reached over and grabbed her sword. The blade was unsheathed and at the figure's throat in the blink of an eye. Wait, Rabion called out. Sonaria froze, keeping the blade outstretched and ready to make her strike. Lower your hood. Ravion sat up and kicked the bare feet off or kicked his bare feet off the edge of the bed, pressing them against the chilled floorboards. He wore a pair of loose fitting grey pants and no shirt. The figure slowly reached up, keeping the dagger in view. Grabbing hold of the hood, it, uh, it fell, revealing a young girl, maybe twelve years in age. Sonaria looked from the girl to Ravion, unsure what to do. She lowered her sword. You're, you're just a girl. You said you were sorry. What have you done to be sorry for? Ravion couldn't explain why, but none of this felt right. He was just happy the scenario was okay. He wasn't sure. Brianna? No. Out. I'm not done. Ravion couldn't explain why, but none of this felt right. He was just happy Scenario was okay. But he sure wasn't used... Er, he wasn't sure what to do if it came to her harm over fuck something. He wasn't sure what he'd do if she came to harm over him. Sorry. It's been a long day. I, I suppose to kill you while you slept. But I couldn't do it. Not when I saw her with you. Who told you to kill me? Well... Wallace Thermo. He said if I didn't, he'd for, or he said if I did it, he'd forgive my ma and pa's debt. I didn't want to, but I didn't have much other choice. The girl broke into tears, unsure what she was going to do. Since I couldn't do it, I don't know what's going to happen to my folks now. Sonaria sheathed her sword and laid it back on the table. You're welcome to stay with me, you and your parents, until this whole thing blows over. Ravion laid his hand on her shoulder. Are you sure that's a wise decision? I understand the reasoning, just are, are you ready for that already? She smiled at him, placing her hand on top of his. It'll be fine. If this is to be our new home, we need to set an example. Besides, what other options are there? I could send a missive to Marvan and... Brianna, please go. Um, what are the fossil things? They're in the drawer in there. Which one? I'll help you in a little bit. It can wait a few minutes. Okay. I could send a missive to Marvan and have a unit of border wardens sent this way. They could act as peacekeepers until I'm able to deal with Wallace. And what would these people do in the meantime? It's obvious he's not going to stop until he has no choice. None of them are safe until he's been dealt with. Ravion smiled and kissed her forehead. She was a natural tactician. You have a point. You'd really take care of us? The girl was visibly shaken, though it was difficult to tell if it was due to fear or relief. It's the least I can do. You didn't kill the man I love, and and that uh, I can show a little kindness in return. Scenario reassured the girl. Gather your parents. We'll leave before the sun rises. Love, huh? Ravion smiled, hearing the word. Shut up. We'll talk about it later. She lightly hit him in the arm. Standing up, she grabbed or quickly threw her armor and weapons into place and wrapped the cloak around herself. Leaning in, she kissed him once again. Be careful. I don't want to lose you to something foolish. And that is the end of that chapter. Uh, stuff, events, stuff, and then I, obviously I have to go tend to the little one who is impatient for some reason that I can't understand. Uh, had a show today, did all right. Wasn't nearly as good as I was hoping it was going to be, but you know I'm not out anything. Just a little bit of time, uh, and you know I did make money, so I can't bitch too much. Um, next one. I was going to be at Library Con. I've talked about this a little bit already. I was going to be at Library Con next weekend. Unfortunately, I have a family matter to attend to, so I'm not going to be able to make that one. 
However, there are still a number of very talented people who will be there, as well as my books. So, you won't see me, but my work will be there, and that's still fairly awesome. So, try to get to Library Con if you can, and have a good time. After that, I believe we have Tricon uh, in September. Uh, I don't remember the date. I'm, I'm so much stuff, I'm bad with dates. But Tricon's going to be awesome. Uh, other news, Order of the Trident 2 is, you already know about 2, uh, Order of the Trident 3, uh, Exodus. Back from the editor, I've been reading through making sure that it's the best possible book it can be. I will probably be having prints, uh, print copies made within the next week and a half or so. So yay for that. Um, I've extended the offer of doing pre-orders to a few people. If you're turning into this, then you know, count yourself included. Uh, I mean, you guys are taking your time to watch this, which means you're supporting me, and well, that's pretty awesome. So, thank you. Uh, congratulations to the brothers on whatever. They've left the AMF, or AMFM radio network and are now doing their own little thing in a uh, bigger place and moving up in the world. And on that same note, a huge thank you to Nathan Shaw, who is one of the brothers on whatever. He took some initiative and shared my page around, and he has, as of the last time I looked, boosted my page likes by 66 in the past two days. So that's uh, pretty phenomenal. We were sitting at four, 449 when I looked earlier. When we hit 500 page likes, I'm pretty sure I'm going to give something away because, well, I like giving stuff away. But that's all I've got for now. Uh, I will tune in, or I'm sorry, I'll do the next chapter next Sunday, and we will go from there. So you guys have a good day, and we will talk to you later. Bye.